Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Reinartz, and I am the Community Development Director at Art South Dakota. Uh, I'm really excited to see everyone jumping into the to the room from waiting patiently for the the session to start. Uh, looking forward again to having Kate and Patrick from the South Dakota Arts Council join us today to uh, talk about some of the Arts Challenge Grant opportunities from the South Dakota Arts Council. Um, I just really want to say thank you again to the Arts Council for, for hosting and joining uh, with these three sessions to talk about all these grant opportunities that are open in March. Um, I know that there are a lot of, uh, as we've talked on some of these other sessions, there's kind of a grant that can fit just about anybody doing just about any type of creative project for the most part. And so it's really great to be able to have these three sessions to be able to really uh, talk in more detail about what the opportunities are and some of the specifics. Um, speaking of, in case you didn't get a chance to join for either the individual artist grant opportunities or the organizational project grant opportunities, uh, those sessions uh, have been recorded and they are available on our website at artsouthdakota.org. So before we get started, I just want to say thank you to a couple of our funding partners that make these webinars possible uh, and free for all of the attendees. That includes the South Dakota Arts Council, as well as the Bush Foundation. Uh, much like the other sessions, we would ask that you please use the Q&A function in Zoom for the question and answer time. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to, to talk through a lot of things, and I'll bring those questions to our panelists today. Uh, and then use the chat function to just say hello to each other, and if you have any technical questions, please let me know. Um, with that, I think we'll just get, get down to business, and I'm going to turn things over to uh, Patrick and Kate to start talking about the uh, Arts Challenge Grant Opportunities. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you to Art South Dakota for hosting Kate and I today to let us talk to you a little bit about the South Dakota Arts Council and our grant programs, and in particular today, our operational support grant program, uh, Arts Challenge. So thank you all for being here with us. Um, the South Dakota Arts Council is South Dakota's state arts agency, so we are a government agency. We're located within uh, Travel South Dakota, uh, formerly known as the State South Dakota Department of Tourism, and we receive our funding uh, through the state of South Dakota and also through the National Endowment for the Arts. The mission of the South Dakota Arts Council is to make quality arts programs accessible throughout the state uh, through funding, connection, and resources. And one of the main ways we do that, of course, is by providing uh, grant support so that organizations can go ahead and create their own arts programming and their own arts uh, uh, projects uh, based on what the needs are at the local level. And so that's what we're do doing here today is trying to meet you uh, to talk a little bit about some of these opportunities and help you uh, with setting the stage for application to grant support from the South Dakota Arts Council. So without any further ado, I'll turn things over to South Dakota Arts Council Grants Specialist, Kate Vandell. Thanks, Patrick. And I just want to echo Patrick's comments and thank Andrew for hosting us today. It's so nice to have this platform to be able to meet with you all and have a conversation about our Arts Challenge Grants. We will be discussing the Challenge Grant category today, which is available through the South Dakota Arts Council. And before we dig in, I just want to remind everyone that our applications close on March 1st. So we'll go ahead and just dig in with the with the slides here. I will let everyone know before we get started that Andrew will send the slide deck out after the webinar and all the links within my my slides will be active and open. So you'll be able to access everything that I touch on. And you'll notice that for the most part, it's the full link that's included in the PDF copy as well. So you can always just copy and paste if you're having a problem with that link for any reason. Just to remind everyone that our applications are open online. We use a system called Go, Go Smart uh, to bring in those applications. Many of you are very familiar with that system. And just to remind everyone that the application system does close at 11.59 p.m. Central. Again, that's on March 1st. If you need support with an online application, we would ask that you contact anyone from the South Dakota Arts Council as soon as possible, and we'll do our best to meet whatever accommodation needs you may have. 
all applications should all applicants should read those grant guidelines posted on the applicant portal and that that link is um, is coming up here on the next slide. We do have some arts challenge specific guidelines that are out there. If you do have questions with anything within the application or with the process as a whole, you can certainly reach out to me. My information is included on this slide or you can contact any of the staff with any technical support questions that you may have. And just as a reminder, uh, as you'll see on the bottom of all the slides here, um, that deadline is March 1st and we do not accept late or incomplete applications. So I mentioned that applicant portal and you'll see the link here. The applicant portal is really our hub for all the materials that you need as an applicant. Again, there's specific arts challenge guidelines posted there as well as a full copy of what that arts challenge application looks like. So that will give you an, an opportunity to see what do I need moving into the application before you even get into the GoSmart system. Just so everyone is aware, and we'll talk about this more as we dig into this application, but South Dakota Arts Council staff we really review and dig into the application and the scoring criteria in what we, uh, what I like to, I'm a sports person. So I like to think of it as like the off season. What do we do in the off season when I'm not um, helping you apply for grants? What is a grant specialist? As am, I, as am I doing? And I'm really reviewing those review criteria and I'm looking through the application to make sure that everything really makes sense for you as an applicant and also for our reviewers. This is a, a cycle of application that we have a little pause on every other year. And so I really took this last year to dig into the Arts Challenge grant application to look a little bit closer at a review criteria. And so you will notice that this is different. Um, it's not different in a way that is gonna upset your apple cart. It's just different in a way that we've restructured the way that we request information from you. And we've restructured that review criteria so that it is simpler and easier for our reviewers to get through your application. And hopefully the same is true for you as an applicant. So we've changed the order of the, and, and the language of the narrative questions. So do be aware of that. Again, to better align with the purpose of this grant category and to coordinate with a simplified scoring rubric. So we're just reminding you, you're not going to go back to that narrative that you wrote two years ago and just upload that, which you shouldn't be doing anyways. You should really be crafting a new message each time you apply. Um, but just so you know, it may take you a little bit more time to to focus and, and be intentional about those responses for this year's application, because it will look a little different, especially for those of you that have um, been in this category of support for years now. Again, we're not asking you for different information. We're just asking it perhaps in a different way and in a different order so that we're lining up better with the review criteria and you'll be able to really find all of that information in those grant guidelines. We are also offering a template, a Word document that will work as a template for you to be able to build your narrative. Um, the, our Arts Challenge Grant category is really one of the few categories of support that we have that we're still asking for that broad narrative. It has all the questions in it. So just like you used to do, it'll provide the question, you respond below the question, you move on to the next question. So that Word document is out there to help you work through that. The advantage of working in some level of a word processing system, whether it's, you know, Word or whatever, is that that gives you the opportunity to, to check your spelling, to check your grammar, to attach it to an email and send it to your board for review. So we're providing that as a tool for you to be able to build that narrative as well. Again, the staff 
uh, my contact is here, as well as all the staff contact information is posted on the Contact Us link at the top of the South Dakota Arts Council's website. So if you have a question and you can't get a hold of me or want to talk to somebody else, you can find all of our staff listed both on the applicant portal, on the Contact Us link, and on the website as well. <clears throat> When we talk about staff support, we have the webinar like you're on today, and then we also have uh, bi-weekly sessions that are just open office hours with as many Arts Council staff as is available at that time. The next one will be next Thursday at 3 o'clock p.m. Central, and the link for that is found on the Applicant Portal's website. That is a Zoom link. It's a Zoom conversation. It's really just an opportunity for you to ask questions. We don't come with prepared materials or an agenda, we're really just there to hear what questions you have and respond the best that we can. We also have a Facebook group that you can join and ask questions on. We facilitate and moderate those conversations. So feel free to jump in there if it's ahead of a water cooler chat or you just have a question. A lot of times what we see happen on the Facebook group is other people are answering that question as well, which is great. Again, staff contact information is, is included on the applicant portal. The link for all of our contact information is included on this slide. And as a reminder, we are uh, state agency. We're, so we're eight to fivers for the most part. Um, so if you're having a challenge over the course of the weekend, it may be a little while before staff is able to get back to you. So we will dig in on to the Arts Challenge Grant category, starting with the eligibility. So just as a reminder, applicants that are not meeting the eligibility requirements for this grant category will not be reviewed. So if you have questions ahead of applying or you dig in and you, you're backpedaling and not sure that this is the right spot for you, please take the time to reach out to us. That's really what we're here for, to have those conversations and help to put you on the best path forward. The Arts Challenge Grant category has the most, um, the, the, the most specific um, eligibility requirements. So I do just want to take some time and go over these with you so that it's, it's clear and, and understandable. We are looking for applicants that are South Dakota based, and these are nonprofit tax exempt organizations. And this is the one eligibility requirement that sets this apart. We are seeking applications from arts organizations and institutions. These may be units of state or local government in addition to those 501c3 non-for-profits, federally recognized tri tribal governments, or you may be an organization that is working through an eligible organization. And the, what we ask specifically here is that you're keeping your financial records for your grant separate from the work of that umbrella organization. Just a reminder that we are no longer using the DUNS numbers. We have fully shifted over to the unique identity, unique entity identity, identifier, the UEI number still trips me up every single time. Sorry about that. So just me, if you have questions about getting that UEI, feel free to reach out to our office. Um, that is through grants.gov and we'll have, um, you can find that all on the link that is available on this slide. Just to dig in a little bit deeper into some of these eligibility requirements, just so they're clear, when we talk about South Dakota base, we mean that you are physically located in the state of South Dakota and you are registered and in good standing with our South Dakota Secretary of State's office. And the link that you see here on the slide is where you can go and just make sure that, yep, I'm registered with the South Dakota Secretary of State's office. Everything shows that I'm in good standing. I can go ahead and move my application forward. Same thing with this, this nonprofit tax exempt organization status. 
we have a very specific avenue of nonprofit that we're talking about here, this 501c3 registration with the IRS. And again, the link here is an opportunity for you to go out and just confirm that your status with the IRS also is listing you as a 501c3 and you're in good standing with the IRS. When we talk about working through an eligible organization, it gets a little bit more weighty in the definition. So we're talking about institutions and arts organizations that are working permanently through the financial support and general guidance of an eligible organization. Again, those financial records relating to your grant and your work are kept separately maintained maintained and demonstrate that you as that entity are using those funds and have financial independent status to be able to move those projects forward. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about what that looks like in a little bit. Again, questions, concerns about eligibility. Um, if that is a roadblock for you, do not hesitate to call our agency. This is a heavy lift. Um, to do an arts challenge grant application. And so what we would hate to see is somebody moving down that path that is for any reason not eligible. Digging in a little bit deeper into the eligibility here, like I said, this is, this is the weighty one. This has a lot of specifications here. We wanna make sure that when you're when you're applying that mission, that vision that you have for your organization is arts-based, that you are an arts organization. You've been active and in good standing for the at least four years, and you operate a minimum of $20,000 in eligible expenses. And that's evident in that profit and loss statement that you're providing. And we'll dig into that a little bit later too. You have a board of directors, diversified income from both private and public sectors, and you're hosting public programming throughout the year. And we are asking for no less than four performances, four programs, four get together, four gatherings, whatever that looks like for you over the course of the year. Institutions that are not eligible to apply would be schools, colleges, universities, historical museums, or societies. There are exceptions there that is I'm, it's verbatim what you're seeing on this slide, but the exception there is for university affiliated programs that operate autonomously for the purposes of carrying out arts related missions, programming. An example of this would be a theater company, an art museum under the umbrella of the university. Those are both exceptions to that school, college, university uh, rule. Just as a reminder, challenge grantees are not also eligible to apply for project grant funding. Just keep that in mind. You're, you've got your lane of general operating support and you're applying in the arts challenge category. Again, if you have questions at all with eligibility, can't hammer this home enough, please contact our office. So also in addition to the eligibility requirements, there's things that as an agency we're not able to fund. I'm not going to work through the whole of this list, but I do just want to remind everyone that when we talk about funding, when we're on these conversations about grants, we are talking about funding that is supporting your organization between July 1st of 2024 and June 30th of 2025. As I work through these restrictions, I want you to know that these are listed in the order that I see the most. And when we say that these are not fundable, it means that we cannot provide you funding for any of the activities on this slide or the next slide. And I can't hit this home enough. That means that I should not be seeing these items in your budget or identified in your profit and loss statement. These are not fundable activities. So if you're submitting these things as part of your expenses, all we're doing is taking them out 
and um, and fixing the budget. So if you can save us all a step and just not include these items in your budget, that would be terrific. Um, these are things that if we do see them in your budget, if we're finding them within your eligible, ex within your expense budget, we're going to kick that back to you and um, ask you to pull those out so that our review panel is seeing the full scope of eligible funding when they're looking at your application. Again, if you have questions with any of these restrictions, please reach out to the, to the staff to talk through um, the question that I get the most often is, why can't I have X, Y, and Z in my budget? And 99.9% .9 of the time, what I'm going to come back and say is that the restriction from the federal government, the NEA, tells us that we cannot fund it. And so then we are not funding it. And I don't want to see it on your budget. That's exactly what I'm going to tell you if you call and ask me why. So hopefully we, we took out a lot of those questions too. So those are all the restrictions. Uh, those are all the no's. We have a few things that are relative gray areas as far as challenge grants go. And those are travel costs and indirect costs. And instead of reading these verbatim, these are included on the slide with details and specifics on what we can and can't fund as far as each of those categories. It is a bucket within uh, travel and mileage and food is a bucket within your expense report. Um, just make sure that you're clearly identifying how those expenses are directly related to the work that you're doing and make sure the same is true for indirect costs. These are included in more detail in your grant guidelines. So I would encourage you to review what's on the slide review what's in those grant guidelines. And if you still have questions or if it continues to be a gray area for you, please reach out to staff and we'll talk through those questions with you. So now we can find, we're past all the no's and the grays, and now we can finally get into the yeses and the what's and the how does this work? So the category of support that we're talking about is this arts challenge grant category. And arts challenge grants are providing you with general operating support. These awards are based on the arts organization's commitment to arts development, artistic excellence, service to their community, and service to artists. So just like Patrick said at the beginning of the conversation, this is the opportunity for us to provide you with direct federal funding so that you can do the work that works best in your community. And this is what we really tried to hammer home as we worked through those review criteria and the application this time. There was just a lot of information and language in there that wasn't to the core of what that means. And so we tried to strip it down as much as we could and get to that core. And this is these outcomes, this is where, where you will really see that shift in the application. And what it comes back to is we're trying to reconnect this stronger to the purpose of these funds. That's where that's coming from. So again, through this general operating support funding, we're enabling you as an arts organization and institution to build a strong and sustainable infrastructure so that you're able to provide programs and services that have the greatest impact on your community. We're asking you to make sure that you are ensuring access to the arts, you're supporting a robust arts economy, and you're enhancing the quality of life for your community in whatever way that means for your community through the arts. So what will you need? Again, we have quite a laundry list. It is a long application. Like I said, it's a, it's a big lift. It's a big return on investment, so it's a big lift. Um, we're able to provide you with this checklist so that as you work through your application, you can make sure that you're finding all the materials ahead of time and you're submitting the best application possible. This 
same checklist is included in that PDF copy of the full application. So you can just print this slide off. You can just print that page of the PDF off, have it right next to you as you're working through the application. Um, I am a very um, process oriented person and I'm a list person. So if I go to the grocery store and I don't have a list, I come back with a lot of great stuff, but nothing that I need. Um, so we want to make sure that you're putting all that great stuff and everything that you need into that application. We are requesting this, this go around a W-9 at the time of application. And we have some resources posted um, that you'll have access to when you click submit of your application to help you work through that W-9 process. You may think, oh, I fill out a W-9 all the time. I know what I'm doing. It's no big deal. I can't, I can't stress enough. Um, we're asking for the W-9 at the point of application so that we can make sure that there are no hurdles between you getting your money and the people trying to pay you. So there's a lot of very specific things that our auditor's office is asking for with that W-9. And we're just trying to make sure that we're providing that to them on the first go ahead of time before you're asking for money so that when the time comes for you to request those funds, it's it's a seamless process. You are getting paid the way that you want to be paid efficiently. And that's our most important reason for having this at the application side, as opposed to after you're getting the grant. If you have questions on that, please have a conversation with us. Again, all of these materials are included in that applicant portal. Be sure to go out there, find that sample application, better understand those review criteria, and use this list to help work through that application. We have two items that we're requesting. They're not required. One of those is our accessibility checklist. And we did a great webinar with Art South Dakota last summer on access in general, and then why we're instituting this accessibility checklist. The National Endowment for the Arts wants to make sure that those activities that you're doing are open to everyone, and it's a priority for us as an agency too. This accessibility checklist is just an opportunity for you as an organization to look internally at how well you're doing at providing arts opportunities for everyone in your community. Uh, it does not going to prohibit you from getting money. It is not going to do anything than hopefully spark a conversation within your organization on how to do a better job of serving everyone in your community. And that is our priority. To the same vein, these letters of support from your partners or from people within your community is another request from us. We really want to see that you've got good buy-in on the work you're doing, you have interest from your community, and you're including them when you're providing programming, um, especially through these general operating support grants. Just another reminder that that application is looking a little different, so make sure that you're providing enough time for yourself, your board, and whoever's working through that application to make sure that you're able to provide all, the, all of the materials that we're looking for this go around. Just as a reminder, as a Arts Challenge grant applicant, you're requesting no more than 10% of your eligible operating expenses. There's details and budget sheets within that sample application to help you work through that process. And then as another reminder, operating expenses cannot include um, all the things that I had listed on that sheet, but just to make sure this is really hammering home, just keep in mind that we're not including capital improvements, new construction or restoration, costs associated with fundraising activities, such as galas, parties, costs of entertainment, including amusement or social activities, such as receptions, parties, again, galas, dinners, cost of goods for resale, including concessions, promotional materials, promotional merchandise, even if that 
is related to your programming. So just a few kind of high level things to think about as you're building those budgets and working through that section of the application. And again, the guidelines in sample application are going to provide you with all of those buckets of eligible funding, as well as all the resources you need to make sure that your budget is correct, accurate, and not including anything that shouldn't necessarily be there. Arts Challenge grantees are required to provide an annotated profit and loss statement or an annotated budget. And that's your year-end financial statement that is annotated. Um, this is another thing that if it comes in without these annotations, we'll be kicking it back out to you. We bring in an outside auditor to review your budget, to review your profit and loss statement. And having it annotated is the best way to make sure that we can work through it efficiently and effectively. This is just a sample from that application. Um, this is what you'll see when you open that up, but we have an entire page dedicated to what the annotated budget looks like, what you need to annotate, and what you need to include. So I did just want to include a screenshot of that here just as a reminder of, of what all the items you're looking for in that budget, all the items that you'll need to include um, when you're annotating that budget. Um, so just as a reminder, it, you're saving us a step by getting that in uh, correctly the first time. And if it comes in without the annotations, we'll be kicking it back out to you and asking you to make sure that you're identifying those areas. As far as some general grant tips, just make sure that you're following the instructions, you're reviewing the guidelines, and more importantly, make sure you contact the staff if anything is causing you problems, if you have questions. It's way easier to be proactive about those questions than to try to make corrections after. Uh, so anything, it could be the littlest Thing. Just feel free to reach out to any of us by phone, by email. All of our information is out there. Keep in mind that our grant funding, even in this category of support, is competitive. Um, you're being reviewed and scored by a panel, and that all impacts how much funding you're receiving as part of your challenge grant. Write those, write those applications. Write that narrative with that review criteria in mind, and again, all of that's included in the guidelines for the Arts Challenge Grant. Feel free to just have that right next to you as you're crafting your responses. That's the best advice that I can give you in terms of writing that grant narrative. Make sure that as you're working through your application, you're clear, concise, and consistent. Don't say, um, I want to paint the walls pink in one section of your narrative, and then the, um, the budget is showing that you're doing everything in gold. I mean, that's just the most basic example I can come up with off my head, but uh, just keep consistent, keep concise, make sure that you are really focusing on those outcomes and that impact of your work um, as you're working through in a way that is very clear and concise and consistent. One thing that I notice most often is applicants maybe get in a pinch with time or are in a hurry to get stuff done just so it's off their list of things to do. And maybe they're not taking the time to proofread or have someone else read through that application. And that's a big miss. You really want to just have somebody else take their time, read through the application, check you know, check for those consistencies. Uh, you know, somebody could easily say, oh, you know, Kate, you really derailed in paragraph three and you're talking about something completely unrelated here. So have someone else review that for you, look through it. And just, again, they're just checking to make sure that everything makes sense. The best person to go to with that is somebody that doesn't know you and doesn't know your work. Um, those are, those are the best people to have read through that because they'll they may have questions if it's you know if it's me and I'm handing it off to Patrick we we're doing the same thing he's going to fill all the gaps that he knows because we're doing the same work whereas if I gave it to some you know stranger on the street they don't know me they don't know the work I do 
they're going to really be able to identify those things that are missing within that application. And then just as a reminder, our grant review process is done by a review panel. They're evaluating and scoring all the applications based on that artistic merit and artistic excellence of each proposal. That's very clearly identified in the grant guidelines. We have all the scoring criteria right there. <clears throat> we as staff review all of the applications ahead of panel review. We're really looking for eligibility issues and we'll contact you directly if anything arises as a problem. Keep in mind that panels consist of both in-state and out-of-state panelists. So don't assume that people serving on a panel know you, your organization, or the work that you're doing. Again, make sure you're answering all the questions, providing all the information, as you would for someone that you've never met before and has no idea what you do in Pierce, South Dakota. You'll see that my contact information as well as Patrick's is here on this last slide. Um, the applicant portal again is where we have all the information, all of those resources available for you as an applicant. There's a header within that page just for the challenge grant that will have the grant guidelines linked and that document of the sample application linked. You can contact any of us at any time with any questions. And then our main website, like I said, we have a contact us link at the top of the main website that will also take you to the full list of South Dakota staff members. And then finally, we are open now and accepting applications for people that want to serve as grant panelists. We ask that you have those applications in by the end of this month so that we have our staff has time to review those and place you on a panel. If that works for us this year, that link is live. If you have questions, we can certainly route you through to staff to have a conversation about that. And that's all I have. Great, well, thanks, Kate. Um, I know this is definitely one of the more uh, complicated of the um, the grants as far as eligibility, uh, but also one of the most flexible as far as how you can use the funding uh, and really provide some great support for arts organizations across the state. Um, uh, I just wanted to jump in personally and say uh, from from personal experience, I highly recommend having someone else read the um, the narrative. Uh, in particular, and really your whole application, if you're anything like me, you 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 jump in and out of it so many times and you copy and paste and you move stuff around and you realize I copy and pasted half a sentence and half of it is completely gone. But as I'm reading through it for the 800th time, my brain just fills in the gaps. And, you know, from simple things like that to, to you know, as you were mentioning, a lot of the people that are on these grant panels aren't from South Dakota, don't know anything about you or the state, uh, you know, even being explicit when you if, if you're from a community, if you're from Lemon and you just say, well, you know, we 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 serve the county. Well, what county? What other communities do you serve? Just being kind of explicit in some of that. Uh, I suppose county would be an OK one. But even if you, you know, so often we say, well, we serve the region or we serve, you know, um, that kind of a thing. And just being explicit to, to help those uh, panelists. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I think that. Uh, um, you answered so many of them so well in advance, um, but um, there is one that came in that I think there's just a little bit of confusion around um, tax exempt and around the SAM registration. So this question is South Dakota based nonprofit tax exempt organization. Uh, the first part of the question is, does this mean one or the other or must be both? I think that they're having some confusion. Uh, clarify for me if I'm wrong, but nonprofit tax exempt, you're talking about federally tax exempt nonprofit organization, correct? Great. I think um, I'm not sure if this person asking the question was was wondering about a sales tax tax exempt, but that is just a nonprofit tax exempt as a 501c3. Um, and then you do need to have the UEI SAM registration now, correct? You can't use anyone else's. And, and that's a free, relatively, I mean, 
trying to sign up for anything through the federal government takes some some hoops as far as getting the logins, but it's a relatively simple process. Great. Yeah, um, Andrew, I'll just jump in there and say we did when that conversion first took place. I think that was happening in 2022. And so if anybody uh, on this call went out at that time and was trying to get uh, their UEI at that time, there may have been delays. But from everything we've heard anecdotally, I'd say, Kate, is it fair to say for at least the last six months, it's been a pretty smooth and quick process. Great. Good yeah, day. yeah, I would agree. It's It's definitely, I mean, when the change came in April, it was, everybody was in, when everybody's in the pool at the same time, it's a crowded pool. Um, it's a less crowded pool now. And so the process is getting a lot more quick. Um, I, I would encourage you if you do not have that UEI yet to start that process now, I will just let everyone know that if at point of application, you've not received that UEI yet, we can certainly open that window and consider your application without it. But we do have to have that UEI in place in order to, to enter into a contract with you as a state agency. Um, so we would have to have that UEI on hand and in the office by July 1st when our fiscal year starts. Great. Um, now there are two questions that are kind of related to the um, some of the the uh, cost of goods in particular. Um, so the first one is uh, there was an earlier slide that says that, uh, and you mentioned you can't fund cost of goods for resale, including concessions. But then under earned income, it says uh, to include concessions in our revenue. So how does that work? The question is, do I do I not include the cost of concession supplies, but do include the income we earn from it? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, we're a lot more, we're able to be a lot more flexible on the income side of it. And obviously we recognize that the, the bulk of many organizations are going to be getting funding in through, you know, concessions, through ticket sales, through anything like that. So we're, we're certainly not picky about where your money is coming in from, um, but what we can't have is you basically making purchases for those concessions and that's not an eligible expense. So yeah, exactly what you said. You can include the revenue from those concessions. You can include the revenue from those costs of goods sold in your income, but not as an expense in on your expenses budget. Great, and I, th I think that directly answers now the next question, but just to make sure, um, uh, there, this organization is an arts nonprofit that also operates a business, a movie theater. So in determining our budget category and preparing our P&L, can we consider our whole org budget minus the cost of goods sold, or should we remove that business portion completely and only consider our, our kind of straight ahead arts programming? Um, or is that a case by case? Give us a call. <laughs> yeah, I, go ahead. Kate. Yeah, I would say we're really just looking at your arts programming. Yeah, and you should probably siphon off that budget side of things. Um, that's my take on it. And I'm not 100% sure that I understood. But if, if what I'm hearing is correct, that they basically have they, they operate as an arts uh, agency, but then they also, as part of their operations, they operate a movie theater. If that movie theater is essentially, you know, operating for profit or as revenue, um, then it probably does make sense to separate those costs because it could get to a point where it's just more trouble than it's worth because of us not being able to uh, accept the cost of goods sold and, and that part of underwriting, that part of the business. Great. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another question just came in. Um, uh, someone was asking where they can find the accessibility checklist. Yeah, so that is actually linked in the PDF copy of the application. Great. Great. Well, um, Unless any more questions come in here, we've we've uh, we've answered everyone's burning uh, burning needs today. It's um, 
uh, been really great to have you all here. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you know, all artists and arts organizations across the state are really important, but a lot of the arts orgs that that apply for these arts fellowship or excuse me, the arts challenge grant opportunities are really the the, the bedrock arts organizations across the state and, and you know you're the ones that are really doing a lot of the the anchor work and kind of providing a foundation for a lot of creative folks to continue to flourish in south dakota so we thank you for everything you're doing um, i want to say thank you again to the south dakota arts council uh, we'll be sending out the slides we'll be sending out the recording as well to you all so you can go back and dig through some of the um, uh, criteria and uh, as always, please reach out to any of us at Art South Dakota if we can be of any uh, support to your work and uh, watch for some other exciting webinars coming up soon. We'll be announcing some spring uh, sessions and uh, we'll be making the snowy trip to back to Pier to be with our colleagues at the South Dakota Arts Council on February 14th for the Arts Day at the Capitol, where we'll be making sure our uh, state policymakers are keeping the arts in the forefront of their, their work in the, uh, in the Capitol. And then I'll also say uh, we'll be sending out the Save the Date soon, but definitely please save the date for June 7th to 8th. Uh, we'll be getting back together in Sioux Falls this year for the Biennial State Arts Conference. So it'll be a really great opportunity to get together with other uh, arts colleagues from across the state, learn a little bit, have some uh, great arts experiences, and just have an opportunity to get together. So with that, I wish you all a really wonderful, albeit cold, weekend, and hope everyone stays safe and warm, and wishing you all the best. Thank you, Andrew and Art South Dakota, and thank you everything, uh, everybody for tuning in today.